Mexico. Hi, everybody. This is Kathy L. Murphy, the Pulpwood Queen, reporting live from my little cabin in the woods. And I'm so excited because tonight we have Judith Kittleman, who has Guest House for Ganesha, which is a novel that is unlike anything I've ever read before. So I'm going to, first of all, uh, welcome out this big crowd we have tonight on this freezing cold here in East Texas. I'm so excited that you guys are all here and more jumping in, but um, let me go. I'm gonna go, I wanna see you all. Let me go back to gallery view. Um, I thank you all for being here and it is so great to see all the support because we're a community of readers and just seeing everybody supporting each other just gets Mandy and I and Robert, we're all so excited. So tonight Judith is here and she has absolutely, um, an incredible background. Um, I'm going to have her talk about her life, her story before we even begin with the book, and then we'll have uh, open it up for discussion. So Judith, tell us, tell us about this journey because this is a, this was a long time in coming, right? I'm going to put you on speak on uh, speaker view. Where is, where is Judith? She's up in the corner. Just say there we go. Okay, Hi, everyone. First, I just want to thank everyone for coming in. I also want to say how special this is because it's International Women's Day. Yeah. <laughs> this is International Book of the Month Day. So how I'm cool really, yeah, I'm really honored. And it's definitely an international group of women. So my background in brief, uh, I call myself yet another accidental novelist. I never in, uh, intended to be a creative fiction writer. I've always been a writer. I've published many, many articles and essays in the businesses that I'm in. Essentially, I've been working in the arts and cultural nonprofit arena for over 40 years, uh, both as staff member at museums and theaters and such, and but for 32 years now as a consultant working uh, locally, regionally. I live in Los Angeles, but also nationally um, with arts and cultural organizations around the country. I was a National Endowment for the Arts planning consultant for many years until the budget imploded in 96. Um, and in addition to that, I'm also an educator. So I've been teaching all aspects of nonprofit management and very fun, the business of being an artist. I teach entrepreneurship and I've taught that at many organizations around uh, the country. But for the last six plus years, I've been adjunct faculty at California Institute of the Arts, uh, team teaching entrepreneurship. I taught entrepreneurship classes at the Otis Art Institute for eight years. I've taught over I don't even know how many years at Art, at Art Center in Los Angeles. So that's essentially my entrenched background and I'm an art historian by training. Uh, the, the way I came around to fiction writing uh, was I was literally, this is not much of an exaggeration, uh, dragged into a friend's new writer's group that they had started on a Saturday morning. And she, among a handful of other friends of mine over quite a few decades kept saying, Judith, you're a writer, you're a writer, you're a writer. And I said, yeah, 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 I'm a writer. I've got this article published here, that article published there. And they said, no, you're a creative writer. And I said, no, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna sit alone in a room. Um, but obviously they knew better than I did. And so this friend of mine who started this new writers group on Saturday mornings uh, made me come and I committed and I honor my commitment. So every Saturday morning at 10 a.m. I showed up with my soy latte in one hand and my um, stacks of uh, paper, paper notebooks and pens and I, was there, but truly for the first at least two months, I had no idea why I was there. And I really hated it, but I, I stuck with it. And one of the most 
powerful aspects of the work her, her name was Maya did was the opening of every um, class was a 20 minute to half an hour me deep meditation. And it was so smart <laughs> because that's what truly cut through for me so much of my resistance. And so I, um, I tried lots of things. I experimented, but I was never happy with anything that I had written. And about two months into it, I realized I have this title bouncing around in my head, you know, and I kept, and the title was Guest House for Ganesha. And I kept thinking, what is this title? Why do I have this title? Where did this title come from? And at the time I thought maybe I had it for a year or so. Um, but I've always loved words and I love etymology. Uh, so I felt somewhat directed at these uh, sessions. And so I'd say, okay, what is, what is a guest house? It's a house behind a house. It's a temporary space. And so I spent time on that. And Ganesha was relatively easy for me because I've always been uh, a student and a fan of Eastern religions and spiritualities and philosophies. And he was always one of my favorite. And so, this went on for another month or so. And then one um, Monday morning, my husband was in the dining room. I was in the kitchen <coughs> breakfast dishes and he's going through the paper and said, oh, weren't you involved with this man? And there was this huge obituary on this man that I was deeply involved with in my early twenties. And, and that shocked me because he, he was much older than me. He was 14 years older, but he died quite young. Anyway, when my husband left, I <laughs> knew that I had, he had to leave, he had to leave the house. Um, but I knew that I had uh, a journal of our two years that I had been involved with this man. And I have to acknowledge that I was never a good journal writer. And I, truly burned most of the journals I had throughout my life. But I knew I had kept this one journal and I found it in the deep recesses of this one closet and I'm going through it page by page. And then there, June 25th, 1983, nothing leading up to it, nothing after it. It, the, it just said the title is Guest House for Ganesha. Oh my gosh. So. At that point, <laughs> I had had that title bopping around in my head for it was probably 18 or 20 some years. And I started shaking and essentially I surrendered. And from that point forward, I committed. I knew this was something bigger than me. And I wrote a magically realistic novel and this journey unfolded in a magically realistic way, not a week. Later, I was in my regular yoga class during relaxation, shavasana. And at the end of it, the teacher read Rumi's poem, The Guest House, which is the preface to my novel. And it starts out with this being human is a guest house. And at that moment, I understood my story. And things just started to unfold from there and I spent the next four years, uh, every Saturday that I could, going to this writer's group. And I didn't know how to write a novel, but it turned out I was writing all these chapters. And then after that four year period, uh, because I have a full-time consulting business and I teach, I knew that I was never gonna really finish the novel if I stayed with this group. So it was very hard because I was attached to all these other writers, but I left and essentially a, most of the novel was written on Thursdays and Saturdays. I essentially made myself a client and oh. I put myself into my calendar and as many Thursdays and Saturdays as I could, I started writing the novel and putting it together. And uh, so started preface, prologue, first chapter, and 
it continued from there. Essentially, the writing and rewriting, 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 and more rewriting period was about 11 years. Uh, then it was a year and seven months uh, to find my literary agent, another three years to find the publisher, and then two years to publication. So that's how the 18 years breaks down. And here I am. It's amazing. It's an amazing journey and story. And it also, you know, your, your writing has this, you know, dream quality that I've been really studying my subconscious and everything. And I just am in love with how you start the chapters, how you infuse them with these and your word choice. I mean, oh my gosh. I mean, you know, here we've been reading Robert Waltney's, you know, and Wander Chang's book and, and, and Mandy Haynes, the words that people choose. All incredible the, writers, by the way. The way you put them in combinations with each other. So I thought that's why I started reading them aloud. And the beginning of the guest house of your book is so powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this story, how did, did it actually come from that relationship or, or that was just the beginning or how did break well, it? That was the here? title. Actually, just uh, the title. a key spark for the story came at the family luncheon following my maternal grandmother's funeral. She, uh, as in a, she was a Holocaust survivor. And in essence, was kind of a mean, nasty human. And was especially mean and nasty to my mother, who was one of three children and her children because she didn't raise us Jewish and she divorced my father. And when both my parents had traumatic childhoods having to do with religion. My mother was a Holocaust survivor. My father was the son of an Orthodox rabbi who committed suicide during the depression. And when, as a child, you have a traumatic childhood, specifically having to do with religion, either you hold fast or you reject. And both my parents rejected uh, their history, their religious history and basically chose other things. But one of the gifts, especially for me, was that they said, okay, this is where we came from. This is what we choose. You all go do whatever. And for me, it was perfect because I've always been interested in all philosophies and uh, thoughts and perspectives and such. So for my earliest memories, I would take myself to Catholic churches and Buddhist temples and Episcopalian churches. And, and I loved it. And it was just about learning. And a key reason why I decided to become an art historian was because to really study our history is to study what's going on at that time. And I first read the Bible in my second quarter at UCLA in art history, because medieval art and Renaissance art, it's the Bible. And I'm just interested in all of that. And uh, I forget, did I answer the question? No, you're, you're right on track, but that's, you know, I kind of feel the same way as you. I was raised a certain way, but you know, one side of my family was once Catholic and then they gave that up and then, you know, became Christian. And, I, you know, I've always thought, how do we know what's the right unless you study them all? Because there's been a lot of religions around a lot longer than Christianity. And, I, you know, so it's fascinating to me too. I, I think that's why I loved your book so much. And um, I hope you don't mind, but I want to read something. <laughs> I, I just, I just, I, it, I just was like, got chills down my spine when I read this particular pack, pack, passage, and it's, um, I've marked it with a paint chip here. Um, okay. While those surrounding her envisioned a new life in Palestine, the believed homeland for the Jews, Esther only had thoughts of India. 
a place she knew next to nothing about, but one that inexplicably called to her like a small child crying out to be comforted by her mother. That chance encounter, ephemeral, ethereal, inexplicable, on the calm banks of the Rhine had introduced an image, a sensation, the glimpse of somewhere more different and mesmerizing than Esther could possibly envision. This and only this is what had kept the remnants of her broken spirit smoldering. I, I it just touched me so much because I fell down this India rabbit hole. And so um, <laughs> I, I just absolutely am in love with your book. And I just want to mention one other thing. As I was rehashing this book and reading different parts, I didn't even realize that Anjali Mitterduva, who's one of my Pulp Queen authors, is also a She Writes author. And she has an interesting background because she's of Mick, well, she's lived a lot of different places, but has this India, but she's an Indian dancer. And she actually performed uh, at one of our girlfriend weekends. And I thought, oh my gosh, and here she is in the back of your book. So I'm going to turn it back over to you. And I want you to Go ahead. Sorry, I remembered, I remembered the trajectory I was on. Um, you had asked about a spark. And so I had started, we were at the, uh, the family lunch after my grandmother's funeral. And at the funeral, everyone at, like at funerals was very nice and polite. And her name was Esther, my maternal grandmother. And she was a master tailor furrier. And so at the funeral, everybody's saying, wasn't she an incredible tailor and her chicken soup was amazing, et cetera, et cetera. But at the family uh, lunch, one of my cousins said, okay, come on, let's talk about grandma and really how mean and horrible and nasty she was. And so people start telling stories. And then my Tanta Tonka, my great aunt, who was my grandmother's youngest sister. She, my grandmother was one of five girls and my Tanta Tonka was the youngest and she had come from Germany for the funeral. And she said, well, you know why, don't you? Why she was so mean and nasty and rigid. And we actually had only ever assumed, well, the war. She had lost 90% of her family. Uh, you know, she lost her husband. She had to give up her children, et cetera, et cetera. And my Tanta Tonka said, no. When she was 17 years old, she was standing under the wedding hoopa in their village, their shtetl, waiting for her beloved to come. And he ran off with the richest girl in their village. And my grandmother never got over it. And she became incredibly hardened. And from that point forward says, no one's ever gonna do this to me again. And it made her a survivor. While most of her family perished in World War II, she survived. And I have to honestly say that was the first time I had true compassion for this woman. And I said, wow, grandma. <laughs> and it was not long before that this man um, that I mentioned had essentially dumped me and broken my heart. And so the compassion was even stronger. And I just had this thought, wow, that would make an amazing story. Never, ever, ever thinking that I would write that story. And it's not her story because honestly, no one knew her story. She didn't share. My mother never talked about their experiences. And so much of it came out of research but the spark was what happened to my grandmother. And also the tagline is left at the altar spurned. What would that do to a young woman's heart? And why would a Hindu God care? And so that's the true spark, but it was all these other elements and having that title. So it was actually percolating a lot longer than 18 years. So I know it's not her, but I'm so, I love that you used her name, that Esther. I mean, that just, you know, I love, love, love that. And I wish, what do you think that she would think if she read this? That's so hard to imagine. She, I mean, I don't think my grandmother 
ever even heard of India, let alone a Hindu <laughs> god. Uh, I, she barely spoke English. I, I don't know. I just, honestly, Mandy, I just can't imagine. But I, I definitely wanted to use her name to honor her story and uh, make the character a master Taylor furrier. Uh, oh. and, but it was mostly made up. Um, I did so much intense in-depth research on writing this book and for the Jewish part of the story, which I had to do just as much research as the Indian and Hindu part of the story because I wasn't raised Jewish. I mean, it was very much all around me, but I wasn't raised Jewish. Probably the most important research I did was at the Shoah Foundation. Are you all familiar with that? Steven Spielberg, uh, with the monies that he made from Schindler's List, he created a program called the Shoah Foundation with the goal to interview every single Holocaust survivor still alive on planet Earth. And wow. he did an amazing job of it. And the um, the foundation is housed not far from me at University of Southern California. And I, one summer I got access to do research and they're all first person testimonies. And it was probably the hardest summer of my life. I went one day a week for seven weeks and I would spend six, seven, seven or eight hours just watching first person testimony of survivors. Mm. And Ooh. It's, it's such an incredible resource in that you can punch in a couple words. Like I knew my character would pass herself off as a Gentile. So you type in pass, passing off as Gentile and then you get all the videos of that. And it was through that research that I learned about so many people who passed themselves off as Catholic. So that was the idea for Esther to um, be Catholic. Wandra, yeah, you're on mute. Oh, what happened to the gallery here? Now there's two of us. <laughs> okay. Um, so what, uh, I, I knew a lady who wrote about her life, she was Jewish. So she wrote about that and she did, um, she did, uh, her book reached uh, Steven Spielberg and she met him and, um, and so she had another revival of, you know, that book. So I'm curious, how did the Jewish community receive your book? Because it's not just about Jewish life, it, it talks about, you know, Hindu and Eastern religion. So how was it? Um, the Jewish Book Council raved. I mean, I've been very, very fortunate that my book has received so much positive response. I, I've received nine awards and recognitions, not least of which is here I am. <laughs> it means so much. Uh, there are of course many people who don't get it and that's fine. Um, but both the Indian community and the Jewish community, the literary community has been extremely positive. Though what, what has been very, very interesting, and I can't say it's just Jewish readers, but I've had a number of readers uh, talk to me about my novel and say how much they love my novel and they go on and on and on about the war and the Holocaust and all of that. And, and then I say to them, well, what did you think about Ganesha? And they'd say, oh, I ignored him. Or, um, <laughs> exactly. Or, or he wasn't in very much. I mean, and the first time that happened to me, it was actually a very close friend of mine who was one of the people who for decades was telling me I'm a writer. And not long after my novel came out, we went for breakfast. And we spent two hours and she's going on and on about my book and raving never once mentioning Ganesha. And so finally I said, so Anne, 
what did you think? She goes, oh, he's not very important to the story. <laughs> and to me, he's the whole story. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what I've learned, and I'm sure all the authors who are here know too, that once you put it out in the world, it's not yours anymore. And, and that's a wonderful thing. And that people see what they see in it or they don't see anything in it. And that's okay. I mean, not every book is made for every reader. That's totally fine. But that's been, I think, my most surprising response. And now that I'm almost three years out, I've seen it quite a bit where some people just want it to be a Holocaust novel. Whether they're Jewish or not, they just, that's what they want because that's what they're used to. That's their comfort level. Whereas, you know, weaving in this Hindu God, it, isn't necessarily comfortable for everyone. Hmm. That's, interesting. It's very interesting. But that's <laughs> what happens is everybody brings their own experiences into the read. And that's why it's so important to bring the author into the conversation to kind of give an overview explanation of why this is important. But I, to me, Absolutely. Ganesha was, you know, and I've read lots of Holocaust books and lots of books on India, but I never read anything like this. And I think it, it's perfect, Judith, because it's giving people who don't know anything about any religion but their own some knowledge and some history and some insight. So it's really a, a book of enlightening, you know. And that I, so I, much to me, Kathy. I, I cannot tell you how much I, I love this book. I can start crying. Oh, well, I yeah. cry all the way through this book. The words are so beautiful. Uh, you know, I'm very emotional about um, books. So um, I, Mandy and I both put so much thought behind the books that we select. I, I think people just think we just randomly pick books. But no, I mean, when you have that many books coming at you, we have to really hone in on the ones that we feel are the most important that will share, you know, this international reading experience. So I'm, I'm just so proud of you. And, and I hope this gets a, another new life and keeps it going because a good book is a good book, no matter when it's written, you know, well, it's what I have learned now that it's three years and that it's still cooking and actually in some ways, even getting stronger. It's an evergreen story. And, and I really appreciate that. And I do, my local independent bookstore, Skylight Books, that I'm so passionate about, that where I did my book launch, they're still selling it gangbusters. And they call it an evergreen book. And they, well, pre COVID, they would have, you know, five, six, seven, or more events a week. And, during COVID, they've only you know been doing Zoom, but they said typically for the events they do, they keep the books for two, three, or four months. But here it is, nearly three years out, and my husband was just it's it's down the street from us, and he said there were five copies, so they keep reordering them, and and I'm signing them. <laughs> Good for you. So they can't return them to Ingram. <laughs> Yay! So can't be returned. Mark girl. So uh, let's open this up for discussion. So Rebecca, Rebecca's next. Okay, Rebecca. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Judith, thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, um, I'm looking forward to reading your your novel. And um, um, I regret I have not yet gotten around to it. Like, anyway, Wait, I'm going to um, interrupt there and say no regrets. What I have <laughs> learned, please, 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 when the timing is, whenever someone reads it, the timing is perfect. Oh, thank you, thank you. No regrets or apologies. So I'm forward to you reading. I love the background story of, of um, your grandmother and, and the name Esther. Um, and I'm trying to remember my Bible school and my memory is weak, but I remember Esther was also a character in the Bible who crossed borders and um, um, married uh, into a different culture and represents, I think, this notion of crossing borders um, 
Esther is also celebrated in Christian churches and in um, the Jewish faith as well. So I think what you're doing here is, is appealing to something that is timeless, this, this need of ours to get beyond uh, these rigid kind of mindsets that you, you have to be one religion or another religion when we're all kind of looking for the same thing. We're so all human. I mean, um, and this is kind of in my blog tomorrow, but it's, I don't consider my novel a Jewish book or a Hindu book. I consider it a human book because at the, the crux of it, the core is about love and heartbreak. And that crosses all borders and nationalities and cultures and orientation. You know, we all experience love and, you know, at one point or another, I've never met anyone who hasn't experienced heartbreak. Absolutely. Deborah has got a hand up. Oh, first of all, you know, I loved your book. I love uh, Ganesha He's up there on my bookshelf. Um, it adds it adds humor to such a tragic story. It adds magic to it. I love the magical realism. And I wondered with your, um, you know, the fact that this title kept coming to you and that it magically appears on one page in this journal, do you think he also is following you, guiding you, calling you just like he did Esther? Do you ever feel that way? <laughs> well, I'll try not to get too woo-woo here. <laughs> oh, oh do, 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 right do. Here. I want to hear. <laughs> to see him right here. Now, honestly, Deborah, and I, I have written this book with an eight-foot, ten-ton Hindu god. I feel that very strongly, uh, and. And he's not gone and he's not done. Oh, it's, um, I, so I also have to say, just honestly, I'm a white girl. And I invoked the voice and the heart and the soul of the most popular and most important Hindu God on the planet. So I had to be really careful and really sure that I got it right. I worked really, really hard to make sure that I got it right. And because appropriation is a huge no-no in arts and culture, and there have been some horrible cases of it. And I know Deborah, you talked about this, uh, but it was probably my biggest concern I mean, I knew I had to write this story and I knew I had to write it the way it had to be write, written. And I can also say, it, I got lots of positive feedback from lots of literary agents that I um, queried. And most of them said, beautiful, compelling story, et cetera, et cetera, but we don't know how to sell it. And then when I did get my amazing literary agent and she was pounding the pavement, to the publishers was getting the same feedback, but we don't know how to sell it. And my joke was, well, if I took out the Hindu God and I put in a vampire, it would sell like that. Oh my gosh, yeah. Because Anne Rice broke that mold. But I knew I had to just stand strong and I knew I had to write the story I had to write. And so one of the gifts of the 18 years is that I was able to be 100% confident that the story I was putting out was true. And because I've got such positive feedback from the Indian American community, from the Jewish community, I'm confident I did it. And I've not had one negative comment like, Judith, you're a white girl, you know, what are you doing with Ganesha? And Honestly, I think he picked a white girl because it's it's like let's let's break through these molds. That's that's uh, a little woo, -woo but but it's, it's very true. profound, and I loving every minute of it because I am a, of the of the thought that if you've got a book and a story to tell, it doesn't matter what color religion are you're from. I think about if To Kill a Mockingbird came out now about this 
Southern white woman who wrote this story about, it's probably one of the biggest books on, you know, race issues and civil unrest and, and, it, and the same truths that were evident when it was written are still the truths now. Yeah. Would it have gotten published, you know? So I, that's, I want <clears throat> books that we can talk about and discuss and open our eyes to other worlds than the little corner we live in. Because, you know, a lot of people never get out of their city or their county. How in the world are you going to ever know anything unless you armchair travel through reading? And now, you know, as soon as this world opens up, I'm going, man. I'm going to India. I want to go everywhere, you know. I, I, and I want to take all my public queens with me. And I want all of our books to be read around the world. So that's why it's so important that you guys are all here joining me and helping me spread the word because this is, this is what's important and this is what's gonna lead to world peace. I know everybody always says, oh, the beauty queen says, I want world peace. But the, the answer to world peace is reading. The more we read the stories, the more we discuss the stories, the more we have understanding. So thank you. Education, education. Okay. Um, to Kathy uh, Ramsberger. Yeah, Thank Kathy. You, Judith, I, I haven't read it yet, but it's in my pile and it's in my ebook pile. That's why I didn't pick it up, but I am excited to read it. Thank you. I don't even know where to start with uh, excitement over hearing what you have to say about it. Um, you say it's an evergreen book and I totally agree, but I would also say it's a book whose time has come because I don't know about you, but my book, which deals with some touchy subjects and about religion, has just caught on. And I would say, okay, maybe it's the awards, maybe it's the promo, but I think it's more than that. I think it is that people are interested in this topic right now. And with everything happening in the world right now, they're gonna become even more interested. So I have a question then. <laughs> Sure. And that's about your process, because I teach and I coach and I start most of the time my classes with an active visualization. So when did your book actually, if you can remember, I know it's been like a long process. When did the active visualization become the process itself? Have you, do you meditate before you? right each time or did it just like there was suddenly a spark i so in my friends writers group those saturday mornings we went through a 20 minute half an hour meditation before each class and that was very powerful uh, but on my own i rarely meditate so if, I, I i take that back. Of, i walk i'm a walker and I walk, oh, that's I live in the hills and I go walking most mornings. And I can, I consider that my walking meditation because I'm, I'm constantly writing. I, I think that's the truth of it. And maybe the other authors here, including yourself experience this. I never stop writing. It's always, something is always there and a kernel will just spark and- I have some writing in a my wrist story. right now. I'm sorry. I have writing on my wrist right now. Oh yeah. Because I was in Facebook group all day and I was like, oh my gosh, that's a great idea. And I couldn't find a pen. Um, so and also I say, I write in my sleep. That I know. Oh that yeah, you dream it. If yeah. I'm stuck at an intersection, let's say, and I don't know, I sleep it off and in the morning I can, I, I figure it out. Well. So it's very intuitive. My writing is very intuitive. I wish I could say I had a true structure, um, but I don't. Most of us don't. Um, I, I mean, I have, a, I have a way of making it easier, but that's what it is, just making it easier. So I guess I need to ask the question a little better. The, when you left your group and you found the journal and there was the title which had been there all along waiting 
Was that sort of when it sort of entered into you? I know I'm becoming woo-woo here myself, but I am woo-woo. Um, I speak it, woo-woo. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> it just sort of enter in, into your body at that point and it became real. That, that's what just really intrigues me. Or was um, it before that or after? And if you say, I don't know, it's fine. When I found the title and that had been sitting there all those years, I surrendered. Uh, you said that. So it was in me all those years and going on Saturday mornings, I was writing and I, I was writing the novel, but I didn't realize I was writing the novel. I just was writing lots of different things. And after those four years, when I said, it's never gonna finish, it's never gonna be a real novel um, until I commit to it, that's when I started going through all the things that I had written and started putting a chap, you know, chapter after chapter after chapter. And one of the gifts of, of this story is that I was actually writing the ending or the direction the book was going, not knowing that it was a novel. So I always, once I knew it was a novel, I knew where it would culminate, Thank which you. I consider such a huge gift because <laughs> that, and that a huge surprise. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I so love that. Lovelace, Lovelace is next. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Mandy. Thank you, Judith. Oh, you know, I'm, I feel so fortunate that I've had the opportunity to speak with Judith on several occasions. And I think one night I was when I was reading, I came across the part about Crystal Knot, and my heart was in my throat. I just, oh my God, the, the I, I just. I do have a, a podcast that I'm going to be releasing this week, Judith, um, in my in my interview. Well, I've been interviewed by you. Thank you. Oh, yay. Good. So, and I hope I can do as good a job as you have, Kathy. And oh my gosh, I've heard some things that I wish I had known before we talked. I'm so really fascinating questions. I'm so glad people have asked. I, I also just wanted to just again, emphasize that the poetry, the lyrical voice that you captured with Ganesha, I mean, to go from, from a, you know, a narrative for Esther to the poetry, to the powerful voice of Ganesha, I, I, that just absolutely blew my mind. And I, I still, still am amazed about that. So I, I, I didn't have a lot of questions. I just, because I've asked a lot of questions already, but I just wanted to say thank you. I, you know, of course, I have my copy of the book, and I've mentioned it to a, a number. Of people. I can say nobody was more surprised than me that I wrote. I was writing fiction, but even more surprising is I'm writing poetry. <laughs> like, how did that happen? But I just, again, instinctively, intuitively knew that the chapters had to start with his voice, and his voice was poetry. Uh, for those that don't know, Lovelace Cook is the uh, podcast Bollywood and Books. And uh, be sure and share that on our official International and Pulpit Queen page because she's our featured author this week. How timely with International Women's Day and all this. It's all coming on into fruition at once. So thank you, Lovelace. And who else? Janine, did you have a comment or question? Yeah. Yeah, I um nice to see you by the way. We're we're always um writing via Instagram or Facebook. Yeah. So it's nice to see you in kind of in real time and space. Yeah. Um it's great seeing you and great being able to tell you how much I love the book, although I've already written that. And um I'd like to take it back to Esther for a minute. Um one of the things that I so admired two things about Esther was um, her skill as a seamstress 
And it was such a beautiful metaphor that you sustained all the way through the book. She survives um, in part because of her skill and her craftsmanship as a seamstress and as a furrier. And um, especially today of all days, um, as we celebrate so many women who are doing exactly that, um, I thought that was remarkable about Esther's story. The other thing that I find so amazing is she's not um, the nicest character. She is terribly flawed in the ways of being a woman and obeying rules and doing what she's supposed to do and being nurturing and being loving. And yet by holding herself in, she, that's the other way she survives. And she gets through the show up. And um, I just, what I found so amazing about your writing was not just the poetry of Ganesha, but counterbalanced by the flaws of Esther and how you presented a fairly unlikable character and yet did so in such a riveting way that nobody wants to put the book down. We are with Esther the entire time and willing her to survive. And I just think that's a remarkable achievement. Thank you so much. I had an in-person book event uh, a week and a half ago and two of the women there were just raving, raving, raving about the book. But at one point, one of them said, so there I was at three o'clock in the morning, uh, my second day of reading the book, wanting to finish it and asking myself, why do I care about this woman? Because I don't like her at all, but I can't put this book down. What did you do? And I thought that was a great compliment. Because yeah. Esther is tough. No question, Esther is not easy. And a lot of, um, a lot of readers have said, Judith, I really would have loved your book and given you five stars, but I hated Esther. Like, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Anna Karenin wasn't such a nice lady either. <laughs> so it, and it was, it was fascinating and dare I say fun to write a mean, nasty person and, and give her humanity. Right. Still, thank you. Yeah. Any others? Jeffrey. Oh yes, Jeffrey. Hi. Um, Hi. I was gonna say, uh, I think it's because we understand Esther that that she's so powerful. Um, and you know, Dickens had a lot of characters that weren't terribly likable either, but they were great to read. Um, I've gotten to chapter nine, uh, and it's remarkable. Um, that's and, a big word. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Um, uh, one is kind of as a writer, and one is just personal uh, curiosity. Um, I didn't hear the discussion earlier. I had to get off for a second. Um, but the first writer question is: How did you get the voice of Ganesha? How did you? What was? How did you do that? Were you listening to things? Were you reading? How did you do that? Uh, well, the real answer, Jeffrey, is I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth of it. I That's a good not. answer. That's a great uh, answer. Again, uh, I'm an intuitive writer. I do tons and tons and tons of research. But like, what was your research on Ganesha? What, what did you do? Uh, Ganesha, I read lots of academic uh, journals uh, and books on the Hindu pantheon overall and uh, Ganesha in particular. I read lots of fiction based in India focusing on the Hindu pantheon. I read uh, lots of journals, uh, lots of 
also first person accounts of being in India and experiences. But I have to say one of the most um, important part of my research, and this may be surprising to people, it was children's books. <sighs> because, you know, I'm reading these academic books and these huge, big concepts and, you know, trying to really distill the information and then excellent children's books, as we all know, they just nail it. They just say it. And I read a lot of children's books uh, yeah. about Ganesha. And I, I just had an instinct. That's great. And um, my second question is, uh, was, was part of this a way of understanding your grandmother better or was that not uh, it at all? The idea of, the truth of it is, the idea of having to spend any time with my grandmother was painful. Um, you know, trying to figure her out. No, it was finding out that she had been dumped at the altar and, and having compassion for her. And really it was the, it was the Ganesha Hindu part of the story that yeah. appealed to me. But when I realized what the story was and I was going to have to spend all this time um, in Europe, uh, as the world is suff becoming more and more suffocating, particularly to the Jewish people. And sadly, it's exactly what's happening in Ukraine right now, yeah. which is surreal. Yeah. Uh, I knew I had to give a gift to myself and I didn't want just an omniscient narrator. I wanted a Hindu God. Right. So while yes, my family's history, immediate history is, the Holocaust and all that, it, it wasn't focusing on just my family. It was the story, but Ganesha and Eastern philosophy woven in was the gift to me. Well, it's very cool. And when I, when I, it took me, I'm, I'm a little d dense and it, and, but when I realized this guy was a narrator, that was really cool. That was a, a, that was just a, wow, this is a whole different, this is on a whole different level. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Judith, I have to show you, after I read your book, I found this. Have you seen this book? No. Oh my God, I found it at half price and it's just about, it's a wonderful book. I'll send you the information, but it's called Eternal Ganesha by Gita Mehta. Oh, it's beautiful. I'm it is just out. chock full of the most gorgeous, you know, you know, I just love everything from India, but I just found it and I thought, oh, this is going to go so well with her book. So oh, I'll send that. you, I'll send you the information. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah. also the other key research was traveling in India and traversing the terrain that Esther was going to be on. And I also, uh, I'm a big traveler. My husband and I, pre-COVID, were huge travelers. And so for the most part, I have been everywhere that Esther is in this book. And she traverses from Poland, Germany, and up to Holland and Paris and such, so. Fantastic. So Beverly's next, but I can't spotlight her because she's not on video. Okay, Beverly. So. And I apologize. I've been on the computer for about 13 hours. So <laughs> my hair looks terrible. <laughs> but you you can hear me though, right? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, you know, Judith, I've just read the first chapter of your book. And um, so I look forward to reading the rest of it. But one thing I have to say is just listening to this conversation and, and getting to know you as an author through this, you're just fascinating. You're a fascinating person. So I know that the book has to be great because it's just fascinating to listen to you and to listen to your process and the whole thing. Um, and I was just thinking, thank you. No, no, it's really, I'm going to tell my husband, you know, I'm fascinating. <laughs> Did you know what was fascinating, honey? <laughs> The okay. fact that you you said it was woo-woo, that's like a huge plus for me, okay? So 
I like that. That's a huge plus for me. But it's 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 interesting too because as you know, writers, we're all thinking about our own process, and so I'm listening to you, and I'm seeing, you know, hearing things that kind of resonate with me and. You say you're like not like a meditator. Well, I like am a seat on the cushion meditator, but I think there's there's something about that that maybe transcends into the writing process too, because it just feels like with your with your walking meditation and just the way that you you are, you're always aware. You have like this constant heightened awareness um, all the time. And it just, it just seems to me that that in some way informs your writing. You know, that's just like not separate from it. You know, the fact that, that it's just this, you're always writing. It's this endless, you know, process that you're always doing that. And it's so uh, it has to sort of, you know, like Ganesh is like, you're, you're taking all this stuff in getting the voice because it's just constant processing through your soul or, or whatever. I agree. I mean, that's sort of what I got. And it, and it's fast, it was fascinating to me. Yeah, it's, I don't separate right. things. I, I mean, I think even as a consultant and an educator, I can, I mean, uh, with my clients, I don't come in and say, this is how you do it. I, I consider it a partnership, you know? I'm bringing something, they're bringing something together, we'll create something that they wouldn't have imagined. And it's the same thing with my students. I, I, I learn as much from them as they learn from me. So, and I think that definitely is my writing. It, it's all woven together. The well, thing- I'm also, I'm also glad you, you were talking about the evergreen aspect of it. And I got some of the same comments when I was going out with my book three years ago. And the fact that you just, you stuck with the story you knew what you had to tell because it's so much, you know, the flavor of the month or what's, you know. Um, so I, I like that a lot because I think we're gonna, we need evergreen books. I mean, those ones that are just the flavor of the month we're gonna forget about, you know. Um, and so that, that was very poignant as well. But I think the point is that so many more books are evergreen than we might think. I, I mm. mean, every book that I know of here in this room is evergreen. Absolutely. There's no reason why any of them should have an expiration date. The stories are eternal. I think just what happens in the publishing world, it gets overwhelming because new books are published every Tuesday and it's your Tuesday and it's really exciting. And then the next Tuesday, there's a few dozen more books that come. And then the next Tuesday, a few dozen more books come. And it's really far too easy for our books to be buried. And I just refuse to let that happen quite honestly. And uh, for my book and for any book that I love, I'm constantly sharing it with people. And it doesn't matter if it was, uh, you know, published last week or published 20 years ago. If there's, there's things in it that are profound or even just positively entertaining and necessary, they need to keep going. Yes, Betty. Um, Aline's next. Uh, Eddie just said she's signing off. Oh, okay. No, hi, hi, Judith. I'm so glad to get to see you, and I've got your book marked here. I I was checking some. It's been a while since I read it, and I wanted to go back and 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 look again. And I I opened the page to um. It's. When she, Esther, it becomes Etta, mm-hmm. when she changed her name. And, and I was just wondering, it says, and, and oh, I'm, I'm jumping around. I love the fact that you brought some, the omniscient narrator came up because I felt like that I, that I really connected with that in the book because 
I feel like the, a story that I have that I'm trying to write, I feel like there's an omniscient narrator, but it, it's not something that is usually welcomed in, in, the, in the, at least the, my writing group and the woman that really helped me to get going, you know, really put, put that, she said, no, you know, the publishers don't like that. Did you get any pushback on, on that part? I mean, he's just such a, he, an important part of the story that maybe that's why it worked that you didn't get, if you didn't well, get pushed back? First, I mean, my, my feeling is very strongly, write your story. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't mean you can't listen to other people and get their thoughts, but it's so important if you have a vision, you need to write your story, period. And then you accept what other, other people say, but the idea of writing for a publisher or writing for an, a specific audience, first and foremost, it has to be writing for you. And that's where the truth comes in. Mm -hmm. And then the truth will eventually go out. I, I, people thought I was really strange. <laughs> and I mean, I, re I remember in my writer's group, you know, when um, sometimes I would invoke the voice of Ganesh and talk about something big, um, the, someone would say, gosh, I'm just writing about the cornfields. You know? <laughs> and, and you're talking about, you know, the ethereal, the ethereal universe. And I said, well, I'm just writing what I have to write at this point. So, but there isn't any right or wrong. I don't know if you were on when I said, um, that I got lots of literary agents and then lots of publishers who liked the book, but said they don't know how to sell it because a Hindu God and a Jewish woman, huh, what? And it, it couldn't be categorized. And I kind of like that. I mean, maybe that's why, you know, one of the top four publishers didn't take it, but honestly, my journey has been more powerful by not having one of the big four publish my book. And I think if they had, it would have been published and buried and disappeared. And I, I feel very strongly that there's so much life for it. I'm not quite certain what that is, but this is just emblematic, you know, nearly three years and here I am. <laughs> so that's, the most important thing I could say to you, Eileen, just listen to people's feedback, say thank you, and write the story you need to write. Mm -hmm. So I, I thank you. I wanted to ask you about Etta's name. And so she's now Etta Gottlieb. And Ganesha says that it literally means God's love. Does it that translates? Yes. That was, that was very, very interesting. And I just, I've always felt that I have, I wouldn't call it Ganesha, but a presence with me always that's looking out for me and guiding me. So it, it really connected, it was beautiful. Well, honestly, I think we all do. I, I don't think any of us are really alone. I could also say that in writing this book, I never had fewer than three thesauruses or thesauri, if that's the right way. <laughs> um, as I was writing, usually more like six because the joy of language was I had a Hindu God. So I could, I could really work hard at the absolute right word and it didn't have to be the popular word of today. And I also use very big book on symbolism. So probably there's so much more symbolism in there than anyone would ever notice and that I would probably even remember at this point, but, but it was really specific. And, and I just, I love research. So that was fun for me. Thank you. I wanna jump in just real quick. And um, I love what uh, um, someone said earlier about how, you, how Esther 
is just not likable. I loved her. Like I understood exactly why she, and it's like, and I'm a little bit like her. But, um, and when Jeffrey said he was on chapter nine, because chapter 10, this little short two page chapter, it's just one of my, I mean, and it's crazy because there's so many good things, but it's one of my favorite chapters. And the very last, there's the last paragraph is two sentences all this beautiful writing and poetic and lyrical and how, but this is my, this is one of my favorites. She provided necessities, even if on the most basic level, he bought candy. To me, I'm just like, that stopped me. And I had to read it again. So that was all. <laughs> yeah, Wandra. You're on mute. Okay, you know, uh, Judith, um, actually your grandmother might have been difficult and it might have been painful to be in her presence, but actually she gave you a gift because it gave you the, you know, without being jilted, the story of being jilted at the uh, wedding day, uh, without that event, you wouldn't have the same story. I probably wouldn't yes. have a story. Man. That's right. And, you know, when I first started reading, I think I told you this, um, I thought, I really thought I was gonna have similar experience as I read Siddhartha by Herman Hesse. Mm -hmm. And it's a story about Buddha. And Buddhism is, you know, Hinduism is a, a precursor of Buddhism, just like Christianity is. Jewish is precursor to uh, Christianity. And uh, the story about leaving the children behind, Buddha did the same thing. He left his family, husband and children. Yeah, yeah. And I was wondering, because all along that's what I was feeling. You know, it's a, it's a spiritual journey, right? And it, this idea, Ganesha is this idea of a protective, uh, powerful unseen presence and it guides her and I, I don't know that's what I all along felt even though it's not exactly the same story um, so it's it's um, it's it was very interesting because you delve into that uh, spiritual aspect of a woman, it's, she struggles a lot, actually. She doesn't say much, this woman doesn't say much, but she does go through a lot to be able to follow that path, right? So did you, did you consider Siddhartha when you're writing or it was not in? Uh, I love that book, I love yeah. Hespa, I, but I, I can't say I specifically thought of it, but it it has been interesting since the book's been out that I've gotten lots of feedback from different people about things that it led them on, like you and Siddhartha, that I never even thought about, but it's in yeah. there. And and there, I think I've heard lots of examples of that. Uh, I mean, one example which is pretty powerful, a uh, friend of mine gave my book uh, to an Indian professor mm -hmm. and in Chicago, University of Chicago. And I was, Chicago's my hometown and we were there in September and I met with him and he said, how did you know about Dixa? And I went, what? He goes, Dixa, Esther has Dixa with Ganesha. And I said, what's Dixa? <laughs> and it's this Hindu experience, which is essentially a moment of recognition. Mm -hmm. hmm. So when Esther is in the first chapter in the samosa stand and she uh, encounters the images of the Hindu pantheon and gets uh, strongly drawn to the one of Ganesha, she has what I wrote is like uh, electrical current went through her. Well, he said, how did you, that's Dixa. 
and it was so fascinating to me that I've written things that I didn't even know I was writing. Wow. So it's like, sure, Siddhartha's in there, Wandra. <laughs> I mean, it, I, I think it's whatever you see or whatever you need is important, it's there. And I think that's true also of paintings, you know, of all, of all art forms, photography. You know, Judith, when I read books, I read visually. And I, I don't know why, but the very beginning of your book, I, I don't know why it brought me to that feeling of being on Titanic. You know, the film, you know, I don't, it was, it's not anywhere, but just the way your descriptions were, I thought how wonderful this would be if India has such a wonderful way of doing this magical realism in their films, if this could be made into a film that was done in India on this story. Because if, I don't know, there's so many movies I've seen where it goes into these dream like sequences and they are masterful at it, at masterful at storytelling and the dance and the colors. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at all these pictures of, and I've seen so many festivals of where they, you know, they have Kanisha and they parade through the streets and they do all this thing. I'm thinking, so maybe somebody in film world land is gonna read about your story and say, you know, that would make a fabulous movie. It would, it, all of your books, every single one of them that you've read, I visualize them. And that's why I have the Book and Film Club. That's why I started the Pulpo Queen Shah Rukh Khan Fam and Film Club because films are another way of storytelling what I see playing in my head, you know? So that's just a thought. Anybody else read that way where they literally see it like film running? Does anybody have that? Yes, Kathy? You do too? Do too, and I write that way. It's like a movie's playing in front of me. I'm really visual, and so I I just see it, and then I just, it's easy at that point. I don't mean it's easy to revise. It's horrible to revise. <laughs> to revise. Yeah. But writing the draft, it's like I just go into this place, and I see it all in front of me. It's like these little actors. So, and yeah, I'm a visual learner you too, you know, and mm -hmm. when you're a visual learner, you see pictures in your, did mm -hmm. you have that happen to you when you were writing the book? Did you see this? For literally, lots, yeah. yeah, lots of parts of it. Uh, I didn't want it too visual when I was deep in the war and crystal knocked and all that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't need those visuals, those images, but definitely for lots of the Ganesha mm -hmm. parts, absolutely. Wow. Anybody have any more comments or questions? Oh, wow. Okay, I don't see any. Listen, Judith, this is fantastic. You're blogging all the, this week. And if you haven't seen what she's putting up there, it's really amazing. Thank you so much. I. Before we go, what are you going to be doing from here? Because this has like been out there three years. Where are you going with this? Please don't stop. Don't stop. Yeah. Well, in regards to this book, my big push is actually to get it translated in German and French. Okay. So my family in Germany speaks English, but not well enough to right. read my book. And we have very, very close friends in France and Belgium who speak English, but not well enough to read my book. So my big push is finding German and French translators and making baby steps there. And maybe Hindi, because I, I, it just seems a given to me. Well, well it, in India, it would be published in English. Because really? the, big, the big reading uh, community in India is English speaking. Well, and there's so many dialects. There's like 500 dialects of Hindi. Yeah. I did not know that. Let's all go to India. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's take these books. But when the book was first coming out, my literary agent was this close to selling it um, in India. And the acquiring editor 
wanted it badly, but her boss was out on maternity leave and it took time, took time. And then when she came back, it was, we don't know how to sell this. Hmm. So, but, you know, people change positions and jobs and they go to different publishing houses or they go into different industries. So French, German, and, and in India would be my dream for this book. So it's not over yet. Oh, no, not at all. But are you working on another book? I am. Yay. Can you give us a tease? Yeah, it's very different. And actually, I started working on it quite a few years ago when I was first looking for my agent and then a publisher, because those are the ugly years. I mean, it's just horrible the way authors are treated. And I was, you know, I persevered, but I said, this is so horrible. I want to be in control and you can be in control of what a protagonist says. So, um, this current novel is called Future Memories. And um, kind of the thread story is a big city girl and small town, much older Southern guy and their love story. But really the crux of the story is about memory and those seemingly incidental things that happen to us that stick with us throughout our lives and while other huge events kind of dissipate. I don't have as good a tagline for it yet for, as for Guest House, but. Well, it, we've seen your way. book. We know that it's gonna be great and I cannot wait. Be sure Mandy and I get a copy when it's ready because, and you do notice what she, the Ganesh is stand, what he's standing on you know, the spool of thread and that thread runs all the way through the tapestry of this book. It's, it's just fascinating. So I just want to say one shout out about the cover. One of the gifts of being published by a small independent is that I was able to work with uh, Brooke Warner and have a very, very close friend of mine design the book cover. And we all know it's really uncommon that uh, author could go out of house to have a book designed. And I give huge thumbs up to Brooke for letting me, the um, Michael Kellner of Kellner Book Design did it. He, he's been a friend for over 40 years and I always knew he needed to design my book. And even though he hadn't read my book, he just knew me so well that he nailed it. He did. I love the cover. And, and it's board, so. The yellow means so much in India. I mean, it is like the color for all wonderful things. So, you know, we've got a thing for yellow books right now this year, right, Robert? So anyway, I, I can't go on enough about it. You guys read this book, tell everybody about it and join the blog. The Pulpit Queen presents her picks tomorrow and get your friends to respond and, and get on there. And then we look forward to Bollywood and Books which Lovelace had to go, but she's interviewing you and it's going to be out this week. She on her... me. I don't know when oh, there you are. Okay. It's going to be on this week. Yes. As soon as I do some work on the search engine optimization on the website. Yes. While I stumble yeah. through that. Stuff. I wanted to just say in a strange coincidental moment, Judith sat next to someone from Fairhope, a yoga instructor, someone I know, and she fell in love with Judith. And I don't know how many copies of your book did she order, Judith, but more copies than any of her friends that she got here in Fairhope to give to all of her friends, which is phenomenal. To me. It's a big reading community. I have a public queen chapter there. So. But I met Angel on a plane flying from LA to Memphis 12 years ago. No way. And we just hit it off and we always stayed in touch. And I had told her, well, I'm working on this book. And then I, I have this thing for Fairhope. I, and I haven't been there yet, you need but to go. I have to. I have to go to Fairhope because I've got other connections too. And when I found out love, like you're in Fairhope? Yeah. That's crazy. And I have lots of really good friends there. Mandy and I both, Suzanne Hudson, Joe Formicella, for Authors, Page and Palette, which is a wonderful bookstore. Yeah. A Wood Queen chapter you can go visit. 
So Emily Bell runs that. So yeah, Fairhope, it's a good place to go. It's in my destiny. And I have to go back to the South anyway to do research for this current book. So that may be- Part of the South is this gentleman gonna be from? In Georgia. Georgia. There, Cairo. Is, is Robert still here? Cairo, Georgia is where he's from. So fantastic. Well, you all, this was wonderful. And thank so you, thank so, you so much, much for you all being present because as an author to have your, you know, comrades in arms in writing present with you, it really speaks volumes. And so be present for each other. And thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mandy, uh, Lovelace, everybody that's here tonight. I just, I am so excited about this year's reading books that I just can't hardly stand it. And if you have a new book, get it to Mandy and I now. It's all up on the website under author member page. So um, have a wonderful evening. Judith, thank you. Thank you. Keep you. posted so on everything. We're going to make it. We're gonna really make fascinating. Fly. We're gonna make it fly. So we just Thank gotta you. get this to end. As it. I say, Kathy, from your lips to Ganesha's ears. Yay! <laughs> I love it. I love it. So thank you, everybody. Thank As you. I always say, Bye. all about Good the job. story. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.